All right, people, we are ready to embark down the path of Shai Halu. We've been waiting for it. It was delayed. It was taken from us a little bit at first, and now we are here. It is Dune Part 2. I am joined once again by Dantre, a.k.a. Tarantino. Eli is back, the resident nerd corner. And we have another newcomer to the podcast as well, Mr. James Rodriguez Medina, a.k.a. McLovins. Guys, are we ready to do this? Oh, you know it. All right. Fear is the mind killer indeed. All this and more on tonight's episode of the Talking TV Podcast. Stay tuned. All right, gentlemen, after two months of cinematic drudgery, we finally have it. Arguably the movie event of the year. And I think it's safe to say that, yeah, no, no, nothing else has happened this year. Like Hollywood could just wrap it up, go home. They could just wait until next year because they, they already delayed Bong Joon-ho's next movie to next year. I mean, I was literally looking at the trailers before this movie. I'm like, wow. So you mean to tell me that the best that Hollywood could throw at us in order to try and compete with this Godzilla Kong Civil War Twisters? With an S, fucking Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, Furiosa, Deadpool 3. That's the best that Hollywood could throw. It's kind of funny because I always love to explore different alternate universes in which, like, what could have happened. And as we all know, Eli, you especially, this movie was originally supposed to open the weekend, the first weekend of November in 2023. And I shudder to think of how Dune 2 would have fared in as packed an Oscar season as we're going to see next year. Obviously going up against the likes of Oppenheimer, Poor Things, Killers of the Flower Moon, Past Lives, Anatomy of a Fall, just to name a few of the movies that we got last year. And that's not even getting into the blockbusters. But now it has premiered the first weekend of March of 2024. And before we even get into the movie itself, like, come on, we can all agree. Like, no other movie is going to top this this year. Like, absolutely none. It, it, it's kind of insane when you when, when you see that, like, that is collectively the opinion across, like, all the movie fandoms. It, it, it's honestly, it's kind of funny when, when you think about it. James, I can see you're chomping at the bit to go. Like, what, what's your thoughts on that? I got to admit, so I, I texted my friend a day, like, on Thursday being like, hey, last minute, do you want to go see Doom Part 2? He's like, saw the first one. He was like, good, like, wasn't, like, wasn't the biggest fan of it. Saw Part 2, loved it. Like, I got to admit, it's one of the best movies I've ever seen. It is, like, not even just as a sequel, just as, like, like a film. Holy shit. It is, I don't, I don't know if I can curse on Can I curse on this? Oh, you can curse. Oh, you can okay. curse. It is one of the, such a beautifully, like, it, everything about this movie was perfect. Like, like you know the Homeland meme was, like, it was perfect. Everything down to the last minute of detail. I was wondering I felt, when that was going to make an appearance. That's how I felt watching this movie because I was in that seat. I was like, everything about it, loved it. Eli, as somebody who has been thirsting for new, not necessarily new Lord of the Rings content, but something that is kind of there to take Lord of the Rings place. And after having been sorely, sorely let down by Amazon's adaptation of the Rings of Power, I mean, how pumped free were you that this is essentially, especially after Denny Villeneuve's announcements post the release of this movie, how pumped are you that this is basically the two towers of the 2020s? <clears throat> oh, I mean, it's like, I, I, I could just tell with the quality of the first one, this was going to be something special. And I, I think Denis Villeneuve is setting up a it just he he's setting it up in a way where he can slightly diverge himself from the books, but in his own kind of unique way, because the, the books really do get kind of messed up later on um, in terms of just some of the things and in terms of adapting it to the big screen. I really I really question how they'd be able to do some things, including to in this movie that I'm sure we'll get to. But um I mean, yeah, it's it basically feels like we're kind of witnessing our generation's Lord of the Rings. So just the the scale and the production quality, and then I mean, the acting is it, it just still. I mean, everything in this movie was a step up from part one, and I, I absolutely loved it. Right. Not to mention the fact that part one was already like a gigantic event in and of it to begin with. And this was a movie that opened during HBO Max's infamous day and date drop year 2021, where it opened simultaneously right. on HBO Max as well as in theaters. That did surprisingly was one of the few movies that, that didn't hurt its box office. But I feel like just the, the the release of Dune part one, as well as the fact that they did not include in the marketing that it was only the first half of the novel. They were very, very ambiguous about that until the movie actually came out. I think that sort of hurt the first movie chance, but we'll get into that once we talk about the actual adaptation as well as, you know, the translation and the decision to split the novel into two parts originally. Dantre, I mean, you had, you had some thoughts on the first one. 
going in, and then going into this one, like I think it's safe to say that like all doubts, apprehension has been cleared up after this one, right? No, for sure, hundred percent. This movie performed phenomenally, shot really well too. Like it's only it's only rare to see movies in this day shot really well that's not super shitty. Also, the worms just look phenomenal. That yes. That's an instant kill. I'm not trying to fight that. I'm out of here. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> like the minute you see the one, wait, was it when he was trying to ride the sandworm, or like it took all the way to the end when you saw there's like the three sandworms all no, coming out of the dust? We pile. found out that he didn't summon Big Homie. I was like, oh yeah, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> that's the they're grandpa, like, no, bro. They're, they're, they're like, get a big worm. No, that's too big. That's too big. Oh shit, he's got it. He's got yeah, it. He he pulled it off, and that's when like, cause I was like at first trying to figure out like, well, we'll talk about this later, but. Just trying to figure out a lot of things again i didn't read the book so like i, I approached this from just coming from like a as a huge sci-fi fan and just being like okay this is i can enjoy because i got let down with zack snyder's rebel movie that was just <laughs> i think we all did <laughs> terrible we all, we i didn't even bother about, watching it I knew it was gonna on, the, on the podcast yeah that was another one where it's like yeah he's trying a little ironically enough you know it's funny that we were talking about like that was his star wars but in this day and age it's like how conspicuous did he decide to split that up into two parts when dune was made the decision to split that into two parts how odd yeah. there but yeah, so obviously I think we should give our audience a little bit of a recap, right? So Dune Part 2, in a very, very rare decision, you almost never see this. So in every single Part 2 situation, you always have a 20-minute recap, give, picking us up on what happened at the end of the first one. Rather, this time we get about like maybe like a two-minute, two-second, three-second recap uh, from Florence Pugh's Princess Erulin, who is, introduces the daughter of the Emperor, portrayed by Christopher Walken. We'll get to that later. But it picks up almost immediately after the events of the first one and adapts the second half of the novel pretty much to a T, which sees Paul and his mother, Jessica, joining with the Fremen in the wake of their family's defeat and destruction by the Harkonnens. Paul's father, Duke Leto, portrayed by Oscar Isaac, has been uh, killed, and the Harkonnens have reclaimed control of Arrakis. But Paul and Jessica have teed up with the Freeman and with the Fremen in order to launch a series of guerrilla warfare attacks in order to destabilize the Harkonnens' processing of spice on the planet, as well as potentially their, uh, Paul being the Lizan Al-Gaib, or the Fremen Messiah, that will lead them, obviously, to greener pastures as well. And what I found probably the most interesting about this is how this movie really, I would say, embodied Herbert's original vision of the dangers of messianic worship and cult-like worship. And the fact that this movie, which is, again, supposed to be, it's the part two, it's the action one, how this movie spends a lot of time with Paul and his confliction with the idea of whether I take this role of the Messiah versus whether I, you know, choose to ignore it. Because obviously there is this understanding that the messianic kind of ideas have been sowed by the Je by the Bene Gesserit cult in order to kind of promote their breeding prophecy over the years. And obviously then you have Zendaya's character as well, the Chani character, who kind of represents the younger generation of Fremen, where in a weird way, it is kind of interesting how this is based on a book written in the 60s. But it is very, very interesting how it embodies kind of modern-day ideals of like older generations being more open to belief, whereas younger generations are very very skeptical of anything resembling messianic like prophecies and messiah figures or anything like that as shiny literally says it's like these are the things that they use to enslave us you know the idea of kind of cult like group like worship of this one figure who may or may not be everything that he's expected to be and i just thought that for a 190 million dollar budgeted hollywood blockbuster to be putting ideas like that first and foremost is it's commendable to say the least because it, it is so interesting how, as we've looked back over the last couple of years, and you look at, like, kind of what are the movies that have done the best? They are the biggest ones. The Batman, Oppenheimer, Avatar, Top Gun. These movies that have these massive, epic scopes. It really is. It, 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 Hollywood has returned to the 50s. Hollywood has returned to the 50s in terms of you either have the biggest possible movies being made by the best of the best in the business, or all dumped to streaming and it gets forgotten about. And you're good luck trying to find it and actually get your movie made if that happens. But... Just as far as, like, the adaptation of the book, Eli, as somebody who did read the book, how do you think this fared? Into, how, where do you think this ranks in terms of overall adaptations of, like, pretty big, heavy, weighty sci-fi slash fantasy books? I mean, I, I, I personally, I consider Lord of the Rings to be the benchmark in terms of adapting, a, like, a piece of fiction, um, is particularly in fantasy. I know Dune is considered more sci-fi but it definitely has the fantasy elements which is the the visions and i know they try to explain that in more scientific terms but it, it kind of feels like a mix of both at times it's kind of like star wars in a way um i mean in terms of adapting the book not everything was 100 percent like uh you know taken um there were a little substitutions which i didn't mind i think for the sake of the movie and to 
for, you know, uh, to avoid complications in terms of like how they're actually going to do one, one plot line in particular. I'm honestly very great. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with how they handled it. I think they did everything in the best way possible. And I think the setup for Dune Messiah or whatever they're going to, I assume they're going to call the third one Dune Messiah was arguably even better than the first book um, because it almost, uh, I mean, when the first book came out, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that it wasn't even planned to be a sequel in the first place. And he kind of, he just, he continued his vision in a a very different way. And, but with this kind of, it being one concise picture, we may be able to see kind of a, like a whole different, kind of interpretation of the still the same like really core like themes of the series and i think could regardless of how it is done whether this next movie is very similar or very different i think i trust uh denis villeneuve and i think his vision um for what he's doing is is probably as good as anyone alive could do it uh i think that uh i mean I don't really know where I was going with this, but I'm, well, just, I'm well, very just happy given, with how it went. Well, just given the that. fact that Danny Villeneuve is a self-admitted massive fan of the books. He even admitted that, like, apparently for, like, his high school yearbook quote in Quebec, he, like, quoted the book or something like that. Like, that's how much of a fan he is. So, like, when it comes to, like, yeah. making slight changes and alterations of the source material, he knows what he's doing and he's doing it for it, a reason. Like, it, yeah, and, I mean, we've talked about in, in other episodes we've done just when, like, you know, I'm the I'm the book guy. I've, like, read everything and everything, apparently, that we've talked about. And just, you know, the adaptations that flop, it's just always they put people who really don't care about the actual source material or are yeah. not really fans to begin with. It's kind of just a project handed to them. They learn about it as quickly as they can, and then they put their own spin on it and think they'll do it better. And that's, you know, I think whenever you do an adaptation – you need to make it for the core fans, and then you worry about you know what you cut out or leave in in terms of you know how to appeal to a broader audience. And I think exactly, I agree. That's exactly what he did. I mean, he's a true fan. It it shows in like how much and the quality we got from this movie. I absolutely could not agree more, James. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you read the book or no? So I haven't read the book, but I do have the. I got it as a Christmas gift, and like I, my dad read the book, and he loves the books. He yeah. loved like the first three ones, so I knew a lot about going into it. So I knew like I knew kind of what to expect for the second one, and I I knew like some of the stuff that like was in the book that was like oh I wonder what they're gonna change. Right. And like, I agree with Eli, all the changes they made for the book, it made sense for the movie. Like like it was like 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 like, like you can tell that he that, that, that everyone in that movie cared about it, like really like took the time to read the source material, really understand. And especially like like some of like the big stuff they did change, like I like like Anna Taylor Joy's character, like like yeah. Aaliyah, like that being Paul's sister was the right. biggest. I think one of the biggest changes from the book, and it made so much more sense for the movie, yes. and it made and it helped. Yeah, because I'm sorry, but like when, when you read how that trip, well, when you read how they incorporate her character in in the book, it, it's it's a little confusing to say the least. So I'm really yeah. really glad that they did it the way that they did. But so and James, my question story wise, yeah, and it, yeah. it made sense story wise to do it, and like it doesn't like take away. Like having like also like like, 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 like read the book like she's like she's like three or four years old with the yeah. mind of like a twenty four because of drinking the way of water that's really hard to do and so it kind of like them just having her like communicate with them and that, like that one scene where like she isn't like the one little cameo so I think sets her up perfectly for Doom Messiah where she has a much bigger role in it where she's older where she's almost like basically almost like almost like like an advisor to Paul. Yes, second, which I think honestly made it was it was better for the movie to do. Yeah, I agree. So now, Dante, as somebody who did not read the book, right? So, so obviously, like I said, when the first Dune was being promoted, when they first started dropping those trailers in like 2019 and 2020, right? There was nothing in the marketing that said that this was going to be part one of two. And I almost wonder if that would have helped the marketing if they had originally pitched this as saying, okay, this is going to be only part one. This is only going to be half the novel. Obviously, we understand why they didn't do that, especially given the circumstances of everything that was going on movie-wise at the time. But now looking back, obviously, because again, part one, fantastic as it was there are still some problems that i have with it as well but now that we have part two like does this work overall as like one uniform product does it still work better as like individual installments or like as part of like this one overall encompassing story like talk about that um first of all that's a big question (laughs) um can you repeat that last part one more time because i couldn't hear you for a second so as far as far as like how 
part one and part one and part two kind of work together to form this one overall story as opposed to kind of it, like the traditional first installment and then sequels route how it uh, what's it called? How they work better as individually? Because like that's the whole thing about Lord of the Rings, right? Lord of the Rings, even though it's three separate books, three separate stories, it's vision all as one overarching story, which is why it's often regarded as one of the best movie trilogies as well. So like, do you think that like Dune now, obviously because Dune's a unique case, right? You have part one and two, which are both the parts of the first novel, Dune, and then you'll have the third part, which is Dune Messiah, which also was originally written not even as like another installment; it was almost written an epilogue to wrap up Paul's story, and that by nature the fact that he has kids are going to write more about his kids and whatnot. So like, how do you think kind of like it all factors together? Um, I think it works together as a whole instead of just doing separate installments because I feel like you can create the story as a whole and build a world and everything and just again I also didn't watch or read Lord of the Rings so like using it as a benchmark as like I have no idea where that sets and I was never really interested in watching or reading Lord of the Rings but for some reason Dune has made me want to like go back and like read the books and kind of see like because I feel like watching this from not knowing any of the material ahead of time, I'm more fascinated because I'm like, oh wow, I'm not expecting stuff. So it's like I, I like how it's doing and I, I wish they would keep it that way instead of just making it three separate installments, but also not announcing that these were gonna be like part one, part two. I think that was a really good idea because people are not expecting what to happen and they're just coming right. out just like, okay, cool. It got me. So I was like, all right, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, because you've got because you've got that unique perspective here. Because like going in, right? Because I I started reading the book like right when they announced they were doing it, and like because at the time, right, Denny had just done Blade Runner, which is solid. It's a good movie, but I still think at the time, like he was still kind of proving himself as a filmmaker. You know, he'd done Prisoners, he'd done Enemy, he'd done Sicario, which I still thought was like the benchmark of his filmmaking ability. And he did Arrival, and that was really like him dipping his toe into sci-fi territory. Well, visually, that movie was really awesome. I still think that movie left a little bit to be desired. I wasn't the biggest fan of the script or the story there. And then when he announced he was doing Blade Runner, I, I like in hindsight, I'm like Blade Runner. It's pretty solid, but at the time, I'm like, what? What is he trying to do here? And then when they announced that he was doing Dune, I'm like, okay, now it makes sense. Now I understand what he's trying to go for. I'm like, if anybody could do it, like, because visually, I'm like, visually at the time, there was nobody. Right when Denny Villeneuve was still a relatively unknown director, I'm like, visually, yeah, there's nobody that's doing it like this guy. Like, he's probably the closest to Nolan that we've got. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then when I, when they announced it, right, I started reading the book as a result of that. And then I'm reading, and I'm about halfway through, and I'm like, wow, this is taking really, really long with the setup. I'm like, they'll probably have to condense the setup a lot to do this. And then when they were doing the promotional tour, and all the images they were shown were just from part one, and I'm like, they and they hadn't cast Faye Routh, or they hadn't cast the Emperor. I'm like, are they only going to do this as part one? That's the only half the novel? I'm like, if they do this, that's a bold choice. Because, like, reading the book, I'm like, because me knowing, obviously, now having read the book entirely, I'm like, all the action happens in part two. Like, part one is good. I myself love setup, but there's a lot of people who are going to be left disappointed at the end of part one when they're just going to end with him joining the Fremen. I'm like, that's that's basically like if you did Lion King, right? But you only, and then you cut it off right when he goes and starts chilling with Timon and Pumbaa. Like, obviously we know where all of these stories draw their illusion yeah. from, but like, as probably the biggest budgeted version of Hamlet that we've gotten yet, it's like, yeah, I'm like, how are they going to pull this off? And now, obviously, I'm very glad having seen what they did with part one because I can safely say that in hindsight, the splitting it into two movies and adapting the second half of the novel as its own thing was a very, very smart decision because there was so much more interest, so much more expansion on the world building, right? I'm very, very happy that they simply chose to focus on Paul and the setup of the conflict of the Atreides versus the Harkonnen. So that way we could, it was almost similar to uh, like Eli, what we were talking about with, with where, what they did with Game of Thrones, where you introduce that first season, you pretty much have the Starks and the Lannisters, quote unquote, your good guys, bad guys. And then that gives you a chance to like flesh out the world and introduce the other characters and the other players as they come in and start to influence and show that this isn't such a black and white, pun intended, uh, story as you may think because, right, you have the influence of the Emperor and kind of you really more so start to understand his role much more so than you did in the first one as far as, like, the, the political, you know, implications of why he did what he did with setting up the Atreides like that. You understand the Fremen and kind of their interesting place in the universe. You know, how, like, in, in the rest of the universe's desperate attempt to control Arrakis, they've kind of overlooked the Fremen and the fact that they were here first, you know, and the fact that they kind of have been really, really pissed off and are just waiting for the right chance to come and go at the rest of the universe. Again, very, very similar to how we're going in the real world right here, right? And that's before you even get into the performance that Chalamet gives here, right? And I wrote this in my letterbox review, which is that what we witnessed with Dune is not only, again, just like this kind of crazy extravagant blockbuster spectacle that is kind of a summation of everything that it is that we love and have been wanting from movies, but this is kind of you're almost witnessing the birth of a new generation of movie stars, 
And we've talked about this a lot in the last couple of years about how the idea of stars have changed because it's not movies that make stars now. It's TikTok and social media that make stars, right? People who are in movies now, they are actors that are simply there to portray, obviously, the latest IP roles, right? It's why we talked about after an entire decade, like, who were the biggest stars that came out of the 2010s? And every time we talked about it, it almost had nothing to do with their actual acting ability. But what we have here is a really unique case where we have a combination of stars that both have a pretty decent big social media presence and have been like working their way up throughout like you kind of like are starting to be aware of who Timothy Chalamet and Florence Pugh and a lot of people have known Zendaya for a long time and Austin Butler obviously recently because of the Elvis phenomenon and now you kind of see a lot of these guys who are like in their mid to late 20s and are about to hit 30s finally started to kind of assume their superstar status amongst the backdrop of, you know, primarily veteran actors who've been around for a while. You know, your Josh Brolin's, your Javier Bardem's, your Dave Batista's, your Stellan Skarsgård's, your uh, Christopher Watkins and whatnot. And I thought that was really, really interesting. I'm like, wow, so... Timothy Chalamet, right, who I've known about for years, obviously, but for nobody in my close circles has really known about, at least not by name, people are finally actually going to know who he is. I'm like, this is the birth of a new star. Now, whether or not he's going to be able to carry movies say like Tom Cruise will going forward, that's to be determined. But at least for right now, like we have witnessed, I think, the birth of a new generation of stars. And I mean, fucking hell, like. Austin Butler, man, I've been making jokes about him since Elvis about how he hasn't been able to drop that goddamn accent, but holy shit, like, <laughs> we just talk about that and how after an hour of just spending, like, a time with Paul and the Fremen on Arrakis, you have all these amazing sequences where he's, like, learning to become part of the Fremen. He's like, I don't want to be this prophecy figure. I just want to, like, ride the sandworms, be part of you, and have cool desert sex with Zendaya and whatnot. Then you cut to Kitty Prime, and you get this whole other introductory second of this villain who you only get to spend this movie with. And that's what's so interesting about Fade Routha. Fade Routha is set up as like this badass villain. Like, again, added to the lexicon of crazy iconic villains like your Lecters, your Palpatines, your Voldemorts, your Shigurs, your Jokers, all that. And he's only in the one movie because as you see at the end, he's in, out, dies. But like, talk about leaving an impact. I mean, oh my God. I mean, Dodger, did you watch Elvis when that came out? No, I saw it like after and I think I was drunk. <laughs> that's fair it's not a very um, good movie but like it's no. kind of insane how that movie has the impact that it does mm -hmm. and austin butler becomes like all of a sudden goes overnight from like this another like disney channel star who's known for like all these terrible disney movies and and for yeah. like being vanessa hudgens ex-boyfriend to now being like superstar austin butler to the point where again he's fade routha in this movie he's in a massive apple tv plus show he's getting cast mm -hmm. in ari aster's next movie and darren aronofsky's next movie he's rumored to be playing the young val kilmer in heat too like talk about somebody that like is getting set up as the next superstar not to mention the fact that he's the oldest one of all these guys all the rest of these younger stars are like between 27 and 28 he's 31 i want to say so he's kind of already like he so, so he's kind of already a little older but like my God, you want to talk about an iconic performance? Holy shit! Yeah, I we wish we would have gotten. I wish we would have got a little bit more of him in that. Like maybe he didn't die. You know, maybe we just like all of it because like I was really. Well, remember, remember his, his bloodline is secured. Remember that. That's true, but That's it's not going to be the same. It's not going to no, be the same. It's but it's like I did like like I really did start to see I'm like okay, yeah, this guy's going to be a huge fucking problem for Paul and. That fight between them two, like their little like bout, I was like, damn, I don't know if Paul gonna make it on this one because right, yeah, he's not it playing around job. like, it like he's fucking job. with you, but like, yo, he he really take you out like, and we all these like battle experience we've already seen is him taking down the three like um the three right, last remaining right, members in, in the of the trades. Yeah. So it's like okay, but one of them was like really trying to give it up, but it wasn't happening. Yeah. The other two were just drunk, but. Yeah, this was a that was that choreography between them two was done really well. I really think I didn't think Paul was gonna make it, but he did. He but going back and like remembering that vision he had, I was like, oh okay, I see what happened. Now. So, yeah. but um, I wish we would have got more of him. Like obviously, see more of like how he really was just tweaking out. But again, still yeah. done really well for sure. And and again, like for within the short amount of time that he had, seeing the dynamics obviously within him and like the rest of the, of the Harkonnen, you know, him compared with the Dave Bautista character who was set up as like this big menacing presence. And then in this movie is kind of just reduced to like a dumb meathead who can't like retain Jeez. control of Arrakis and whatnot. And the fact that you got fucking Drax the Destroyer get flipped on his ass by fucking this little twink is that, that was just so many different levels right there to begin with. And I mean, 
like, first of all, Eli, like, how many how many dudes in Oswego next year do you think are going to be dressing up as Fade Routha for Halloween? Let, let's let's just get that out of the way right now. I say girls, uh, not girls. Yeah, you know what? That's, say, fair. I, uh, That's fair. That's fair. I can very much see that. That's a techno. Giddy Prime is just a, honestly, this is a techno world. Honestly, sure. yeah, yeah, very heavily oh, AI HR Geiger influenced as well. Amazing. I really did. The, I think that was visually, in my opinion, the best part of the movie was that whole sequence of him oh, yeah. fighting the... I mean, I was just blown away. Especially with the, the fireworks, how they were like... Uh, they were almost like little like... Uh, I, wanna, I mean, blots. it's kind of like... Yeah, like ink, ink blots. It was, uh, it was incredible. I just thought, like... Yeah, I loved that. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, I, I do find it interesting that in one of the other movies that we didn't talk about at the top of this uh, at the top of this stream that's coming out later this year is Gladiator Two, which don't even get me started on the reasons as to why they made that movie. But I just am really laughing hard that like, wow, you got a fucking sci-fi movie that's already doing Gladiator better than the actual Gladiator sequel that's coming out later this year. I just thought that was funny. And as far as like the politics and the setup between him and the Baron and everything, where the Baron kind of like was testing him in order to see like, okay, he'll be able to succeed where his idiot cousin has failed and whatnot. And you have like this whole middle section where you also get into the logistics of the Benny Jesseret, and you really start to see like how they've started to how they've like really been fucking around for generations and influence and stuff. And I yeah, literally. And <laughs> the fact that like they'd route that and, and like he's introduced as like this psychotic, crazy guy who like delights in killing is like just randomly cutting servants' throats and shit. But like even he like really didn't stand a chance in terms of like, yeah, like he is just you once again yet another cog in this machine that these that this cult of concubine witches have essentially set up in order to try and like make sure that the universe goes in the direction that they want. And I I I, I mean that was just insane in and of its own right. And that's before we actually get into the whole end point where things really start to get kicked off, right? Where we're back on Arrakis. The uh, what's it, what's it called? Faye Routh is there. He blows up the main Fremen stronghold at Siege Tabor. You got uh, Zendaya's best friend is is GG's right there. And then you have Paul is like, fuck this whole thing that I've been trying to avoid. But this whole thing is like I've been trying to avoid going south because south that's where the fucking fanatics are. And I'm gonna go south. They're gonna praise me as the Lizan Al Gaib. And then this holy war that I've been having visions for. Like, it's good because you also have him who reunites with another character that we at the time were not sure it survived in the first one, that being Josh Brolin's character, Gurney Halleck. And he's like, bro, you've got all this, you've got a, a literal army ready to fight for you. Why are you waiting? And he's like, because if I do this, then it's going to be, then the universe is going to be like thrown into chaos and warfare. And all these visions that I've been having since the events of the first one are going to come to pass. And I don't know if I can hold myself responsible for that. But once the bombing happens, once Fade Route is there, that's what it's like. All right. We can't wait any longer. It's go time. He goes south to the stronghold. He drinks the water of life. He's awakened as the uh, Lisa Al I'm a little sad we didn't get the father. The seeker, the seeker has awakened vibe. I know they're not trying to do any connections to the David Lynch one from the 80s, but I'm but I was still hoping for that one. And I mean, James, you were talking about it before. We didn't even get a chance to talk about Jessica, his mom, and her role in this one, where she's got a very oh. crucial part in terms of like basically setting Paul up for his journey because she, at first, at the beginning, is told by Stilgar, the Javier Bardem character, that, like, yeah, you basically got to become our new reverend mother because as part of the prophecy, right, you basically got to influence your son and kind of push him in this direction. Otherwise, you know, you won't. And also drinks this poisonous water while she's also pregnant, which not only turns her into the reverend mother, which basically gives her, like, these all-seeing, all-knowing abilities, but now also you have her commuting with this fetus in her stomach who obviously will be, again, be born to be Paul's sister and will have a crucially important part, again, in a 10-second cameo played by Anya Taylor-Joy, another member of that superstar, the kind of younger cast that I was talking about, who's in this movie for a 10-second cameo as Paul's sister, Aaliyah. I mean, what did you think of Rebecca Ferguson's performance in general? Because I feel like that's one element where they kind of shifted things, where in the book, Chani has a much bigger part, but in this one, she's more so the skeptic, and you really have, I would say Jessica has an even more important part in this one than she did in the first one. So, like, and Rebecca Ferguson, as somebody who has been coming up over the last couple of years between the Mission Impossible movies and Dr. Sleep as well, like, she's a bona fide superstar now as well, albeit a little older. So, like, what did you think about her role in this? And as far as, like, kind of the importance she had in terms of pushing Paul to where he needed to be? Oh, I mean, Lady Jessica, I think, is, like, one of the probably most underrated parts of this movie. Like, she did an amazing job with this movie. And, like, the first one, like, she was kind of, like, shepherding Paul. Like, she taught him the voice thing when, like, even though, like, her whole point was, like, of uh, her being a Benny Jesser was to was was to give was to give a daughter so that they could be raised but then she be raised like in the Benny Jesser ways didn't do that give him a son but it was still teaching that and then, and then the way like her her role in this movie I think was so important where she was like like once you once you drink the water and like the in the communication she was having with her daughter I think was one of like the more like funny parts of the movie where like 
where like this, this movie did a really good job balancing like dramatic like romance the comedic parts the action perfectly within this movie and i think right her, like her role was super important because she's almost like like, like, like she was like basically like, telling paula look like it is your like it is your destiny like do it and paul was so hesitant to do that and like she tried her best to do it and then even when she went south honestly like the like the robe she got after she became like the reverend mother i thought was really good and like and like how like like how she is in the beginning of the movie to the end when she sees like like the main reverend mother lady where she's like like oh like like the, the difference between the two i thought was like honestly amazing but i really like everything honestly everything about this movie and the way the characters were amazing and like, even like even like the changes they made too like like gurney Halleck when he comes back he in the book i'm pretty sure like thanks lady jessica was a part of the reason why house like by uh why they fell and tried to kill her them taking that out made it like i think was honestly good and like almost like like him coming back and being like paul this is your destiny doing like and quickly became like a supporter but like in that big honestly like Oscar, like i think one of the best parts of the movie that whole scene where he comes in is like I am like like I am I am your Lisa and I give and like takes charge and like he's like the shiny he's like I was like oh get down like like follow it like right. I think it was amazing and he was like he was so quick to like be on like once he like it's all like be on the side and was like was like like like, like, like was like that older mentor mentor that he had with like Duncan Idaho in the first one then obviously sadly he died but then like he kind of took that role and was really like it was like that important military advisor from like from his other from his other family I think it was important to have in the movie but honestly. Everything about this movie just amazing. And when you're talking about the the Giddy Prime, that whole scene, like I was waiting for that scene to happen, like for the for them to introduce. And I was like, oh, it's really like I liked them doing this, like like that first hour just on him in Iraq. He's like him getting to like 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 learn the Freeman ways in the sand, and like him like right in the worm. And then that immediate shift to Giddy Prime was like it felt like a whole different movie with the black with the black and white with the black sun, which I was like. Oh, I wonder if they filmed that with like is it black and white? But then the reason why it's all like so dark, where like like there's like a scene where when the Reverend Mother comes where it goes from like the color indoors and transitions into the black and white. I was like, oh my god, this is beautiful. Yeah, cinematographer's wet dream right there. Oh, it was amazing. And like the whole fight scene where like it was pretty much a test for us for uh Fred ID was like, Oh yeah, like obviously like these two main people, but like he was kind of like testing was oh yeah, like you succeed in this and you're getting it. And he, and he honestly, like he did a pretty, I think he like, he did a pretty decent job with it where like he did more action than his cousin, his cousin or brother did. Yeah. Yeah. Cousins. Where, like he, imme- where, it's kind of, where like he immediately like, like his, like his cousin was kind of like, not the best where like once they attacked, he went straight to the stores and attacked them and then got defeated by the free men. But then for Freddy, like when he came in, he immediately bombed the shit out of the stronghold. And kind of like provoked and kind of like provoked the main conflict by getting them south. But like he was like already he's like he was like he was like I've been wanting to do this. And also I realized too the Benny Jester like the, the same thing he did with Paul did the same thing with him. We're having that camera named Leah Sado's right. character. Yeah, the, the, the lady like, Henry character. Yeah, the the Benny Jester would have. Like, yeah, the, the Benny Jester would have an interesting role in this in, in terms of, like, like I said, in terms of them influencing, right, different, obviously, potential messiahs. But I do also love how Fayed Rautha, we, again, within just this one installment, is set up kind of as, like, the anti-Paul, you know, where it's like Paul is, obviously, yeah. has this very strong connection with the maternal figure versus Fayed Rautha. Obviously, you know, the, the whole thing is like, yeah, he killed his mother and whatnot. And I, I, he's again, also, like, like, psychotic, too. Yes, like, he's, like, exactly. Kind of, like, they, crazy person. Yeah, so just we... Just kills there, wrap my head yeah. His reward was some cheeks. Literally, just, literally, literally, it's crazy. But all again. it took, yeah. Again, again, we again we, we we talk about the mommy complex. It is it is very much a thing. It is very much a thing in in this universe and in the world. Now, gentlemen, we've talked a lot about the story, and we've talked a lot about obviously you know the directions, the comparisons to this in part one. It's place, but like let let let's talk about what this movie does in space, which is the visuals. And I mean, again, we got Hans Zimmer back on the score. Greg Frazier, who also shot the Batman as well. Let us not forget that on the cinematography. And it's just like, they just let, and also, can we talk about the fact, can we talk about the fact that this movie utilizes practical effects and models and it never skimps on it. And like every time I'm worried that, uh oh, we're going to get a crappy CGI shot. We're going to be able to tell the difference. And it never has that. I mean, just the freaking sequence of of Paul riding the sandworm, which I knew was going to happen, and I'm just waiting. 
and I'm waiting mm -hmm. for when it happens. And then they put the thumper in, and then it's coming through. And the fact that, like, how you're with him the whole time as he's falling through the sand dune. And, like, you feel like you're, like, stuffing it with him. Like, I can only imagine what it would have been, like, if we'd watched this in 40X. As far as, like, if they would have just, like, shot sand in us and, like, made us feel like we were, like, suffocated <laughs> with him. Because, oh, my God. That was amazing to say the least. I can already see the inspiration. Sad part, it's not sand. It's coke. Just. <laughs> 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 and, 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 like, <laughs> oh man! And then we're like already like amped up. Maybe I mean, that's I mean, what spice really is. I mean, yeah, listen, you, listen, you, can't, emperor, you can't tell me it's not. That's what not spice, spice is. Uh, listen, you know? I, I, I mean, that, now, now we know what runs our cars because, like, yeah, because remember, spice is also what's used in order to like create the need for interstellar travel. So I mean, hey, mm -hmm. we want to talk about those ships being on speed. They were not kidding. But um, the other, the other thing, I mean, the the, the ending sequence, like we're we're building up to it, but it's like the minute. That Paul comes out and he makes a speech to the Fremen, like, yeah, I am the Lee Zan Al Gaib, and you all are gonna listen to what I say. From that point on, like, holy shit. Like, he sends a letter to the Emperor and is basically like, Yeah, I'm alive. You took your best shot. You missed. Come at me, bro. And the Emperor comes and you finally get to see Walken just doing his walking thing, where he's like, Baron, what what why? Why have you what has happened with the spice production? I'm I'm not seeing our figures back to what they should be. And and, and, and and fucking fat ass on the throne is trying to explain it. And then yeah. the Sardaukar comes in and cuts the fucking... They literally cuts him down to size. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you see fucking... First, the, the nukes go off. Then the sandworms come in. Then Shani lead the... Oh, my God. It's... Oh, man. Sorry. I, I, I got to stop from nergasming out here too much. But, like, I just... We, we don't get a chance to, like, just go nuts over how good visuals no. are in movies anymore because we've been so inundated with such crappy cgi for so long that when something like this comes along that actually puts its money where its mouth is visually and it pays off and helps enhance the nature of the story i mean my god like guys when was the last time we got something like to this level of epicness and i don't even know if endgame cracked this with its final battle yeah probably I think Probably. this is the best sci-fi movie yeah. since Interstellar. It's, it's, it's wild to think about. Listen. If, you think, if you think about it, a year ago, M and Quantumania came out with a two hundred fifty dollar million budget. <laughs> yeah, and, and that like, looked like shit. It looked like Spy Kids three so bad, but I'm so for real. Like Spy Kids three was good. Though. Spy Kids three D was yeah, better than Ant Man three. Right. And the Absolutely. visuals of this movie were so immense. Like I was in my seat, and I and I felt like I was in the world where like it felt so seamless with everything: the visuals, the costume design, like. Like honestly, once Paul, like once Paul did that speech, I was in my seat like, oh yeah. my god, this movie's got even better. Yeah. And it's just perfect. Like the like the whole like whole like when then like when they go and like when they stuff the nukes and the worms come, I'm like honestly, if I was one of the Sardar Car soldiers and I saw a worm, I'm dropping my swords. I mean they, that's the what they did. It. That's right. I'm so you running. Right, you have the Sardar Car who that was like these insanely crazy and assassins who assassins. are like backing up the Harkonnens and slaughtering the Atreides one by one in the last one. And now they're like running, quivering their boots when they got these big ass sandworms coming your way, just fucking take kicking ass and taking names. And, like, of course, the fact that it's, like, yeah, it shows, like, oh, this is the reason why they were holding back. Because if they had attacked with this in full force, they would have wiped them out in three seconds. Like, three seconds. Like, you even see it. And I love how, too, fucking, you got, like, I, I did notice this to Dantra, and I know that you saw this, too, when Josh Brolin takes out Batista. And, and, and I'm, like, oh, this is Thanos' revenge against getting pumped by Trax in Infinity War. And I know you were thinking the same thing. I said, you got his get back. Yep, he got it got back in blood. Back. He, got, he got it back. He got his get back. I no, thought that was. That I was just want to highlight. When you got projects like this, who's the always the main person that's scoring these projects is Han fucking Han Zimmer. Fucking Han Zimmer. There is every no, time. Every there's time. no missing with this man, bro. Nope. No. The no, score from incredible. Man of Steel. Yup. Interstellar. Yup. Oh, and that's just two of them. Like this man did the, again the Dark Knight score. This man, oh my god, like the the, the pirates originally Pirates of the Caribbean. This guy did Gladiator originally. You know, could the you man imagine did Lion King. like you're on this world and you're a starter car, bro, and you hear the Hans Zimmer playing? You know you're dying, bro. It's over. <laughs> you know you're he's, dying. He's just bro. in the background playing the keyboard. That's, that's but you you're dying guy. to an epic soundtrack. Yeah. All right, fuck it. I got it. There's, you know, like, ways to die. there's, there's no ways way. To die. There's no. There's no crazy guy that's sitting here like, yeah, I'm gonna fight these worms. He's dying first. I'm at least try to run. But then they got the nukes going off. It's it's a bad time for you right now. But just enjoy the music.
Yeah. I, I just want to talk about like how when 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 fat ass, I, and of course I'm referring to Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, portrayed brilliantly by Stalin Skarsgård, is lying there on the throne as Paul comes up, greets him as his grandfather, because as we finally learned, Lady Jessica is the result of, you know, rape between the Baron and uh, and a Benny Gesserit witch, uh, discovered, right, that they are descended directly from the Harkonnens. And he's looking down up at Paul and realizing, oh, man, did we fuck up? Did we fuck up? Right? Because the Baron's whole thing, right, is the Emperor, right? He knew that the whole thing of them getting relieved of Arrakis and the Atreides getting them, that whole thing was a ruse that we could come back bigger and better and also have a chance to take out our immortal enemies. But, I mean, oh, man, this whole thing was fucked from the beginning. And he was like, oh, yeah, we got this political edge because if the Emperor tries to say that, oh, it was us, we could be like, oh, yeah, but you backed us and we had no choice but to follow your orders. And, 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 and you know, he thinks he's got this whole thing in the bag, putting Fade Routh in charge. And, oh, man, does it just fall apart at the seams. Not only that, but he gets killed by somebody, by the grandson that he didn't even know that he had and just left out in the desert to fucking rot with the worm. His entire line gone. Well, except for Fade Routh's bastard baby with the Benny Gesserit which and then you got fucking Drax getting punked by Thanos like which is which is so embarrassing on so many different levels like for like like the, the Harkon is major majorly screwed up and then you got the Emperor who's sitting there and he's trying to justify his actions being like mm-hmm. oh Paul like I I I, I loved your father but y- y- I y- your father was was a weak man and he just he, he had no vision no no concept of what was going on so naturally I had to do it and Paul's like Listen, you could have avoided this if you just left us alone. You could have avoided all of this if you just left us alone. But no, instead, you listen to this fucking Betty Jesser at Witch here. You done fucked yourself. You fucked this other family. And now, you, and now you've indirectly caused this holy war that I'm about to wage because the other great houses, right? He even said at the end of the first one, right? What were the great houses afraid of? The emperor flexing and abusing his power because then that would cause them to team up. And he's like, and now, because you forced my hand and you forced me to do this with the Fremen, something that I did not want to do in the first place, now you've indirectly caused this massive war across the galaxy that's now gonna fuck everything up for everyone so walking just gotta be sitting there feeling like a fucking idiot which he is you know, you know I think, old I, spice addict in I addition i'm a her. fucking daughter too that, that too and it's like and i'm gonna take a, it's like and i'm gonna take it's like and i'm gonna take your kid too and make her my wife yeah that was uh that was yeah i've never i've never seen uh just so a sequence of events just go go so poorly for one person uh just the emperor single-handedly lost all his power and then his daughter in the span of like two minutes it's just you gotta feel <laughs> but i think i think what's interesting yeah, you gotta exile uh, like, too yeah too. Yep. Didn't, didn't it. yeah you get exiled away yeah too, like, exactly on, like yeah. two minutes yeah but Not the like emperor's him. speech, I think, was more projection than anything because mm-hmm. the whole reason this all started is because he was envious of Paul's dad. Yes, and Paul's yep. dad, did, like from the first movie, I think is is I like his portrayal where he does not have an interest in you know, even wa- taking the throne. But obviously, he's very popular among the great houses now and everything. And it was just literally par- no more than paranoia on the Emperor's part. Yep. So I think for him to give that speech is just, I think it's ironic more than anything. Mm-hmm. And it, it really shows how weak he really was because this is all just out of fear. And look yep. at kind of where it got him. Exactly. And, and, and again, it just goes back to the brooms of Herbert's writing and the fact that this is exactly what Herbert well, envisioned, right? The fact that, fe- well, the fact that fear and mesia- and kind of messianic worship has contributed to, again, just this massive war. The whole thing, right, is a critique on religion. That's the whole thing as far as what it is. A critique, religion it's a critique and politics. On, it's a critique yeah. on religion yeah, and it's a critique yeah. on mass politics and colonialism. Colonialism. Exactly. I mean, come yeah, on. The, mean, Fremen are, the Fremen are literally supposed to be Afghanistan during the Cold War. Like, the, the illusions are very, very obvious here. I mean, the, the well, themes and ideas in this yeah right. the th- the themes and ideas in this story really just like transcend generations i mean this book came out in 1965 you know yeah 1965 and it is you know like it, it still had a, a, a even growing fan base even before the movies like it, it just it's it, there's a reason for it is because of like it's just the complex nature of like everything and we, you know herbert created a situation where the good guy winning essentially might be the wrong choice in right. the end ultimately kind of right. especially we see the you know in the last few minutes of what it's gonna what it's gonna end up meaning for humanity so it just yeah. i find that so fascinating and like you know just because the good guys won doesn't mean it's immediately right. going to be better kind of thing yeah. so. especially given that you follow in the next 60 years of media are pretty much trying to take that approach but not the but not actually understand the essence of it because they're pretty much taking the hero's journey but having right. to be like, oh, the good guys win, and yay, everything works out, and it's copacetic, right. you know? And and it's like, and, and I'm glad that we're finally getting back to the root of it. It's like, no, that's not what happens when you have this. In fact, <laughs> things almost always get 
worse when that happens, you know? And I, I love that they actually stuck to that. And you just see this look of dread on Paul's face at the end after he's killed Fade Ralph and after he's deposed the Emperor. Like, oh, the Great Houses are not accepting your terms. And he's like, he's fuck like, I, I didn't want to do this. He's like, fuck it. It's war. It's war. Yeah. Like, very, very curious about. to see what Paul's tax policy is going to be. You know? Yeah, that's going to be interesting to say. I mean, oh, man, the, 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 the price on the spice purchasing is about to go way up. Like, way so it was up. So interesting about it to – oh, sorry, Dom, how would you go? No, you're good. Yeah. I say it was interesting is, like, is like I, will, I, saw this, I saw this when I was reading, like, reading up on it. Like, if you compare, like, say, like, say Zendaya's character, Shani, who, like, for, like, the whole, like – like, look at it in the beginning of the movie where she – that open narration where she's talking about – like the oppressors, how like how they turned the rackets into essentially from what it was a paradise into one that basically like like a milit like a industrial complex. She, like like uh, one thing I like how they changed the character in this movie is how like they made her like a skeptic where she was like, oh he's not it. And even even as Paul like decides, okay, finally I'm gonna take it, and he does that big speech, and she, like and she fights and she and like he leaves the charge. She's still skeptical, but he but she still fights with him because she's like. I still love him, but at the end, I mean, I think the biggest difference is that she leaves. Is that she leaves and she goes on her own, right? And like it, the fact that the movie closes with her as the fremen have almost like are becoming the almost in a way like the oppression are going to leave off world for the first time to fight, and how they all like and like I love how they end up like Stovar, like he's like yeah they're all going into the ships and like blindly just following him, right? Which I think is like one of the big things that, that talks about is like a religion about like 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 fault like 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 following these like prophets right. that sometimes might not be good. And Paul like is like, he's in the fact that like, he, Oh yeah, he won where he got his revenge, but he's that revenge is causing this whole war that's going to kill billions of people. And they're going to have a massive impact on the universe. Yeah. Yep. All like, all just from yep. that. All in, just in, in order to pull another quote, in order to pull another quote from Lord of the Rings, again, the battle for Arrakis may be over, but the battle for the universe is just beginning. Yeah. Kind of yeah, to go off of, funny. uh, Yep. Yeah, kind of to go off what James was saying, I really, I think Javier Bardem is a real standout. Aside from, obviously, I mean, Timothy Chalamet, I think this is probably the best movie I've ever seen. Him Easily. In. This, is good the best of, he's, this is the yeah. best he's been in anything. Oh, ironically, yeah. and, and I, ironically, the fact that he got his career started in Interstellar. So it's kind of a yeah. full circle moment there. Yeah. But I, I really think Javier Bardem was like played his part perfectly in this movie of just like and that you could just tell the biggest like biggest hype man ever yes oh i mean and he was so convinced that like even all like it, it, it you see it like in religion like he's getting contradictory messages and he's still kind of finding yeah. a way exactly. to like, and Paul, the fact that, like, Paul every time like i don't want to he's like i don't want to do this i don't want to be the messiah and he's like the messiah will prove to be so humble he's, and he's, <laughs> he's yeah, messiah. Yeah, i thought that was hilarious yeah. i was like that's funny still great <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything he did he was like the messiah and, the and messiah. he leads you know i mean he's the guy leading the charge like he's the biggest believer it's like even if others behind him yeah. like he's literally still the, the point where he's willing to have you know? paul kill him just to yeah. prove that he is the messiah like that's how much invested he is in this i want to talk about that scene but eli i have a question for you ask away now you only know the person i've known that's watched attack on titan and understands the story of attack on titan right right do you see comparisons between paul atreides and aaron yeager oh one million percent yeah. it, it, like uh, one million percent it's not even up for debate. Like I, both two characters that didn't want to be in charge are left up to make some terrible decisions. Like they, I don't really know. Like I'm assuming the holy war is going to be insane. Bodies will be dropped for sure. Yeah, yeah but very interesting. But I, like I said, I'm just I'm going off like what I'm already seeing. Men says I'm let nukes off at the entire great houses. Like I'm assuming these are people who are controlling other people to the universe. So it's like it's really about just going up, but then you got Aaron Yeager in Attack on Titan, and he's like, "Yo, listen, I could really just." Granted, what he did the rumbling for was very different, but it, it's still like another like hard decision that he didn't want to do right away until he had to, right? And decimating eighty percent of humanity. Yep. 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 But, but yeah, but yep. also that scene where he goes to the temple and he's like, "Ain't none of y'all in here gonna stop me." And they all get tight, and then he starts. I guess he tells that that guy like a story that he only knows, and he's like, "Oh shit, my fault, gang. Right. Big homies here, right. <laughs> and it's all yeah. over." After that. 
And he just like the man's yeah, just talking. At that like, point, he guy. just he just accepts it. Like, all right, well, uh, you know, this is the guy. Uh, I'm a bitch. Right, he's my god now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally. And, and everyone, I love how too they're like, oh, like, only like, only a fremen, only a person that is a leader of the fremen tribe can have this speak. And it's like, motherfucker, I'm the messiah. I'm the guy you all wanted to come. And now you guys he, are he all of a sudden to play by your rules. Like, like, come on. Like, what's what's going on here? I admit, yeah. like, like after he drank the water of life, he turned, like, he almost, like, he changed a little bit where he was like, I know what I have to do. And he walked in, like, he owned this shit. Where he was like, this is like no, I'm going to talk because I want to talk. And then gives that beautiful monologue. Right. And uses in the voice as well. And in English. In our language, too. And the fact that after he does that scene where, he, like, he, like, tells the story to, like, about, like, the mother, about the grandmother, everyone's like, hey! Oh, it's and the Messiah! It was great. It was great. And then it was great. And at that point, they're basically like they're loyal to him. Like they were like, like after that, like they'll do anything. Where like they're gonna fight a war yeah. that's not even theirs to fight off right. world. And that's just like like they're so like almost like, almost like blind, like, like blinded by this messiah and this belief that like oh like they wanted it. And like the fact that like Shani's the only one that like see, kind of sees through it, which I think was the biggest like character difference because like in the book. Like she's all like she's by her side and in, and she plays like a pretty big role in Messiah. So I wonder how they're gonna adapt her character. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see Messiah. how they translate this from like, again the biggest change. Especially the fact they cut a big part where like I don't like for the book where like they t- like they like they kind of sh- like showing like the time like oh, the time of the book where in the book it's like three years. Yeah. It's like two different between after. But I did notice. I did notice this one thing that. though. I noticed that there was a lot of cutting around and a lot of. I noticed the thing that they did a lot in earlier seasons of Game of Thrones is where you would have like a certain amount of time pass by, but they wouldn't tell you it, and you could kind of only tell based on the way that they were editing it. You know, like the way that like Jessica was prog- yeah. was progressing along, like pregnancy wise. Like again, they did I mean, shrink. It was like definitely year. not three years. But like there was some time was that like definitely passed for sure. It was yeah. like less than a year. A year. It, months, it, it wasn't. It wasn't even a year because Jessica's daughter less wasn't born. Right. Yeah. True. Because yeah. yeah. in the book, like in the book, like in that two years, like she has Aaliyah. Aaliyah and then, yeah. In the book, well, and then Paul and Aaliyah have a kid, uh, and Johnny have a kid in the book. Yes, they do. Who dies. dies? Yes. Yes. And they cut that part, which I think was honestly good because them yeah. introducing a kid and killing the kid off like that. Yeah, that like, that would have been like, confusing. To what, say it would have threw yeah. everything out of way a little bit, which I was like, "Yep." Also, uh, as like, much I, as I did, I, I as as much as I did miss him, the decision to cut Stephen McKinley Henderson's through Fear Howat character, I think, worked for the best because the the character unfortunately yeah, has kind of a thankless ending that really doesn't contribute much. So the fact that they kind of just like ignored it and they were just like, "Yeah, he's like probably off world, like serving as the Baron Zuma dad on Arrakis." I'm just wondering so. what Tim Blake Nelson's character was going to be because he originally now, was cast in an undisclosed role. I'm and assuming I, 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 that he would have been a member of the Spicing Guild because you also did not. Not really see any members of the Spicy Guild included, but that might be one that they hold for Messiah because the Spicy Guild plays a very, very big part in terms of the forces that are attempting to rally I'm against Paul sure. in Messiah. I agree. I don't know. I'm, I don't know. Eli would know this. Like, uh, like Lady, like the Leo Sado character. Like, I think, I think I heard a rumor that he was playing her like husband, who was like one of like like one of the best fighters in the like in the galaxy. Who, oh, who's in, who, and, and, yes, and, yes, yeah, actually, and, 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 and he, he's in, that. and I'm pretty sure he's in the do and the I think he's in the one that David Lynch made, I'm not fully sure, but he was a character like it made sense why they cut him and they kind of like incorporated some of the stuff into right. like Austin Bell's right. character. Honestly, I'll admit, like, there's some movies where like they cut stuff and you're like, oh, they shouldn't have cut that, that makes them really change yeah. it. This movie took all the like, it, like, all the changes they made made sense for this movie. And it helped the plot out, like make it go a lot smoother. Where in the in the book, it's like a like there's a lot of like almost like little, like little kind of plot holes where like it's like it, it would have been harder to adapt it if it was like by the book. Which honestly, if people can complain about them not including certain stuff, it's an adaptation of the book. It's like if you're adapting a like if you want to like if you want to if you want to watch like read like if you want to see a by the page adaptation, just read the book. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly, and that's why I think it's the message that's more important than the actual, exactly. like keeping it scene for scene, you know, accurate. And you know, I think the way they handled the Leah was probably for the best. Yes. Obviously, I was, you know, coming into this, I was going to be like, this is going to be very interesting to see how they handle her. But even though they didn't really go the full, you know, uh, you know, the full length of her arc with her character and kind of just kept her in the womb, I was honestly all for it. I think it it still did the part in terms of what her character was supposed to to do for the story because it kind of just shows like, yeah, I mean, Jessica, Jessica does not have really the full power. It's the, the kid right. is basically kind of has the full power telling right. her everything. And uh, I think, you know, I, I think right. 
it's still going to to spell very interesting things for the future. So I, I'm I'm all for it. I think Aaliyah, I, I've I've read up to book four, uh, so I, I I know the full extent of Leah, Aaliyah's full arc. So I I really have no issue with how she was portrayed in this movie. I'm very excited to see what they they do in the future yeah. with her. I, I will say this, and then we'll wrap it from here, going into final thoughts and star ratings. But I will say that one piece that was in the Lynch version that I'm very glad was not in this version because that would have definitely taken away from the pretty consistent tone was how the fact that both in the book and in the David Lynch version, Aaliyah is the one that famously kills the Baron and greets her at him as grandfather and whatnot. And the way that they do it in both versions is so stupid, where you know how the Baron has that flotation device because he's so fat he can't walk where she literally shoots him with a poison dart. And because of the way that, like, how fat he is, he almost, like, floats around the room and, like, deflates as he's slowly <laughs> dying. It's like a fucking Bond villain death. It's so stupid. And for something as corny and as dumb as the Lynch version was, it worked. I'm so glad that didn't happen here. Like, the way that it happened here was so, so much better. I just, I had to point that out for, like, the diehard, like, original Dune fans. And also the fact that, um... You know, also, you know, in addition to previous adaptations, right? So famously, it is known that Alejandro Hodorowski was originally going to adapt Dune. And I believe that some of the casting was going to include um, Orson Welles as the Baron and Mick Jagger as Fight Routha, which would have been hilarious to say the least. I, I forget some of the other names. I, I believe uh, Salvatore Dali was going to play the Emperor, I want to say. I, I don't remember who he's going to cast as Paul. It would have been wild. He was going to try and make it like a 12 hour long movie. There's a whole documentary out there about it. You guys can go watch it. Anyways. Guys, this has been fun. Again, we could probably be here for another three hours talking about this, but we do, we do have to wrap up. Eli, James, I know you guys have place to be. So with that being said, James, your first time on the podcast, final thoughts and your star rating out of five for Dune Part 2. I got to admit, like, one of the, I think one of the, the, like, this movie does every character so perfectly, even, like, the smaller characters. Say, like, Christopher Walken. He's probably in the movie for, like, six, seven minutes a month. Like, he has, like, yeah. little scenes, like, scattered throughout the movie and his, like, big role in the end. Everyone has like fits the role so perfectly and embodies it and like and like they take their moment they like they take the time they're on screen and they fucking and they do a great job with it. It's like you're watching and you're like, wow, given all the awards out there, it deserves it. I'm like the visuals, the music, and one of the and I mean that scene where like the end where like the where the Reverend Mother is like considering what we're about to do poetry and he like and he silences her with using the voice and he like goes back, he's like shocked. I was like, let's fucking go. Shut the fuck up, lady. Like, <laughs> like her advice, uh, her advice like telling, shut your old telling ass the, up. Telling the emperor what to do basically caused all this. You know, she's like, like everything about this movie, Alamit, is just, is honestly amazing. This is probably one of the best movies, probably the best movie released this year, is will hands down be considered one of the greatest movies of the 21st century. Just, and I'm honestly so excited to see what they do with Doom Messiah, like I know, like he, the director said that he's probably not going to do past Doom Messiah, and I think honestly they can end it with Doom Messiah, and that would be considered one, honestly one of the greatest trilogies of all time. This movie was perfect, and it's honestly unfortunate we probably have to wait another five, six years, probably five years for yeah. Doom Messiah to come out. But honestly, I it's worth the wait because I know he's going to craft like it, it, the, the three part three is going to be like it's going to be like the, like. Like Return Lord of the, the Rings King. three yeah, type gonna level, like Return of the King yeah. type level, and I'm and I'm going to be there on day one watching Doom Messiah when it comes out end of the decade. Yes, when you are twenty, when you are twenty nine years old, when both Doom Messiah and Avatar four come out. Uh, Eli, your final oh, thoughts, and, uh, <laughs> Eli, your final thoughts and star ratings for Dune Part Two. Oh, I mean, it, it's just absolutely incredible. As a fan of the book, I I, I couldn't have come out feeling happier. And I, I'm so excited about what's to come because at least with the books, there wasn't that consistent vision because it was kind of just turned into more afterwards. Whereas now we have a consistent vision and at least some changes that, you know, I think probably will be for the better if we're keeping it, you know, consistent with what Denis Villeneuve has done so far. So I, I'm so pumped uh, for what this, uh, this is going to potentially turn into and just, I mean, I, there is not a single scene in the movie. I didn't enjoy. I, I was like, just, I, I was having the time of my life. So uh, absolute easiest five-star rating i've had to give probably ever on this show uh so yeah that's that's where i'm gonna leave that yes and dontre your final thoughts and star ratings for doing part two um 10 out of 10 for sure um again 
someone who doesn't hasn't read any material probably will find an audiobook or like that or read it now because kind of I, I need to know. I need to know what happens. I can't be feeling this left out. Um, <laughs> again, phenomenal movie. I really see the vision. I really see where they're going with this. And like again, I'm I'm a big like cinematography person. So like I love greatly shot films. I have no problem. This is gonna definitely win like score of the year or whatever. So like whatever. I don't watch Oscars anymore. But yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah, again, again just uh, running back. Again, just I mean, the cinematographer. You were talking about Hans Zimmer. I mean, this guy, this guy who shot the Batman. This is the guy who shot Rogue One. This is the guy. Uh, he he no shot ends. like a, a ton of exactly. He, he, this he is this is a doing. clean sweep. If yeah, something else comes out this year that will compete with that, I doubt it. No, this is this is but winning everything. This, this is, is winning. This, this is a clean sweep. Director, all the technicals, adapted screenplay. It possibly could get Tim Timothy his his first Oscar. Finally, yeah. no. This, I, 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 I'm right there with all you guys. This is the easiest five. Yeah. Uh, like I said, this is the easiest five out of five, 10 out of 10 that I've given a movie. And like I said, the rest of Hollywood can, they can just pack it up because nothing else has happened this at it's all. GG. This I don't year. care about Wolverine. It's, just, it's, it's the fact that like yeah. this gave us, the, the, like after two months of just shit, this gave us like something to actually be hopeful for. And even though, again, a majority of stuff got delayed because of the strike, at the very least, this will be enough to satisfy us until like the next cool thing comes. And like I said, we'll get some cool things. Most of it is going to be on TV, specifically in the month of June. But for the most part, we can safely say that Dune Part 2 is the cinematic movie event of the year that everybody needs Cinema's to see. Cinema's back. In a theater. I, I cannot stress that. this enough. In a theater on back. the biggest screen possible with the best sound possible. Gentlemen, this is it. James, do you have any place that you want to plug social media wise? Uh, no, but I am going to see Dune. But when I'm back in the city, I'm going to see Dune and IMAX at, uh, at the theater near, at BAM. I'm yes. seeing it like biggest theater. I already like I already told my parents. Seventy like, millimeter. Oh, yeah, we're we're yeah, going we're... seeing it like scheduled like like Sunday. Like no plans. We're seeing that movie. Yes, it's on it lock. Yes, Eli. Any place you want to promote on social media? Uh, promote my Instagram every time I'm on here. It's pretty much all I got. If you if you search my name like how it is on screen, uh, it'll come up. Uh, shoot me a DM. I love to talk with people about this stuff: movies, TVs, books, storytelling, telling in general, and soccer, it's, and soccer. Uh, Dude, I am a slut for soccer. Let me tell oh, you. We know. I, oh, don't I, we know. I, oh, don't we know? Oh, don't we know? Oh, we know. I, I am 10 <laughs> times more passionate about soccer as I am about storytelling. So whenever I get around yeah. to starting my soccer podcast, expect some big Telling you guys it may be happening sooner rather than later. That's all I'm going to put out there. And yeah. Dontre, again, where can the good people follow you on the interwebs? Uh, besides the usual, man, follow me at official Big Mafia if you listen to house music. Also, twitch.tv. The Black EO for Twitch gaming. There we go. I'm, see, I was saving it for you this time. I was saving it for you this time. And of course, like I said, at Movie Nerd Reviews, at Official Talking TV, YouTube, Twitch, Spotify, this episode will be available tomorrow for all of you Dune heads to listen to. We'll be back next week. Well, I'm still figuring out what we're going to do next week, but we're going to be something probably Oscar related on the Talking TV podcast. We'll see you guys. Content is officially back for 2024. We'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.